Uh, Genesis chapter number 18, we're going to continue. We uh, dealt with the first part. We know at Genesis 18, God visited Abraham, and we looked uh, and we saw Abraham's desire for the Lord. He was anticipating for the Lord to come. Uh, we also saw uh, how uh, he was willing to serve the Lord. He brought all those things to the Lord, and he was re re ready to hear from the Lord. And I believe uh, that we see Abraham and his disposition... Uh, was that that the Lord is going to go now to the second part of the chapter and reveal something to Abraham that no other person knows except God. Uh, pretty uh, important thing. It's a familiar uh, time for us here. And so I want us to begin reading in uh, Genesis 18 and verse number 16. Uh, so notice here, Genesis 18, verse number 16. And the, man, and the men rose up from thence and looked toward Sodom, and Abraham went with them to bring them on the way. And the Lord said, Shall I hide from Abraham that thing which I do, seeing that Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation, and all of the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him? For I know him, that he will command his children and his household after him, and they shall keep the way of the Lord to do justice and judgment that the Lord may bring upon Abraham that which he hath spoken of him. And the Lord said, Because the cry of Sodom and Gomorrah is great, and because their sin is very grievous, I will go down now and see whether they have done altogether according to the cry of it, which is come unto me, and if not, I will know. And the men turned their faces from thence and went toward Sodom, but Abraham stood yet before the Lord. So, if we notice, we know that there was two angels in the Lord that had met with Abraham, and they uh, go towards Sodom. Abraham goes with them, and there's a pause. Now the uh, two angels are about to go to Sodom, and Abraham is left alone with God. And so notice in verse 23. And Abraham drew near and said, Wilt thou also destroy the righteous with the wicked? Peradventure there be fifty righteous within the city, wilt thou also destroy and not spare the place for, fifties, for fifty righteous are therein? That be far from thee to do after this manner, to slay the righteous with the wicked, that the righteous should be as the wicked. That be far from thee, shall not the judge of all the earth do right? And the Lord said, If I find in Sodom fifty righteous within the city, then I will spare all the place for their sakes. And Abraham answered and said, Behold, now I have taken upon me to speak unto the Lord, which am but dust and ashes. For adventure there shall lack five of the fifty righteous. Wilt thou destroy all the city for lack of five? And he said, If I find there forty and five, I will not destroy it. And he spake unto him yet again and said, For adventure there shall be forty found there. And he said, I will not do it for forty's sake. And he said unto him, O let not the Lord be angry, and I will speak peradventure there shall thirty be found there. And he said, I will not do it if I find thirty there. And he said, Behold, now I have taken upon me to speak unto the Lord. Peradventure there shall be twenty found there. And he said, I will not destroy it for twenty's sake. And he said, Oh, let not the Lord be angry, and I will speak yet but this once. Peradventure ten shall be found there. And he said, I will not destroy it for ten's sake. And the Lord went his way as soon as he had left communing with Abraham. And Abraham returned unto his place. I want to draw your attention to the last expression we find in verse 33, where the Bible says, or in the middle of the verse, as soon as he had left, the Lord went his way as soon as he had left communing with Abraham. Uh, we see here that the Lord... At the beginning of Genesis chapter number 18, he came to Abraham to commune with him. Now the word commune here simply means to speak with him, uh, to uh, fellowship with him. And so we see here that the Lord, uh, as we count as we consider Abraham and the Lord communing with Abraham, it is a tremendous privilege for the Lord to commune with Abraham, to speak with Abraham, uh, to talk to Abraham. Now, at the beginning of the passage of Genesis chapter number 18, 
We find that the Lord comes to Abraham and uh, Abraham may, uh, gives him uh, uh, the best. He basically serves him a meal. And uh, uh, the Lord reiterates the promise about Sarah that would, she would have a son. And we know Sarah laughed. And Abraham is, has complete confidence in the Lord because even as the Lord said, Sarah laughed, even though she denied it, Abraham said, no, you did laugh. Uh, you see, Abraham, uh, in the first part, we see he is ready to hear from God as God is going to speak of what he is about to do to Sodom and Gomorrah. Now, as we read through this text, uh, perhaps there are some titles or headers in your Bible, and they uh, have a, a certain heading, and the heading I have in my Bible is Abraham's plea for Sodom. Uh, some people have entitled this uh, Abraham's intercession for Sodom, or Abraham intercedes on the behalf of Sodom. But I, I really don't believe that that's what's taking place in this chapter. Uh, as a matter of fact, if we read the text, you don't find God asking, uh, you don't find Abraham asking God to spare the city. Uh, he's asking God to spare the righteous. Are the righteous going to die with the wicked in the city? Would God destroy the righteous in the city with the wicked? And so although here uh, in the approach of this passage, it, it seems to me that often we, uh, people have approached this passage almost with the idea that, well, God was angry and, and uh, God didn't love the people in the city and so uh, God had to be reminded by Abraham that, uh, uh, that uh, he ought to be, uh, care, care about the righteous and he ought to care about the city. And almost as if uh, uh, God needed Abraham. But that's not what we find here. As a matter of fact, the question is, Abraham is asking the question, are you going to destroy the righteous with the wicked? That's a simple question. He is not pleading with God to change his mind. He is simply asking what God is planning on doing. Would God destroy the righteous with the wicked if there were 50? God said no, he wouldn't do it. Would God destroy the, uh, the wicked or the righteous with the wicked if there were 45, if there were 40, if there were 30, if there were 20, if there were 10? And the Lord says, no, he would not destroy the city for 10's sake. Uh, but as we look at this passage, I really want us to consider the here that God is communing, he is speaking to Abraham. And really, I believe that sometimes with the way we approach passages, we miss what is going on. I believe here that the hero of the story is not Abraham. It's God. Uh, if we look at the context in which we've seen now the city of Sodom, and we understand that the city of Sodom is a wicked city, to me we understand uh, some important truths about God, about the righteous, and about the wicked. And often here we can see here that as, uh, uh, we can see in this passage that as God communes with Abraham, Abraham is going to learn something about God. And really, I believe that as we study the, the, the Word of God, we find that God speaks so that we can learn about Him. Uh, so that we can know Him in a better and greater way. When we look at the times of Abraham, Abraham did not have the Word of God in his hands. And as we consider in those times, God spoke to man directly. Uh, we see in the Old Testament, He spoke to man in visions and things of that nature. Uh, but now we have the complete Word of God. And so at that time, God communed, God spoke with man. God uh, wanted man to be aware of who He was by communing with man. And that is what's taking place in this passage. Now concerning this communing, if you would, this speaking with Abraham, I want us to consider several things in our passage. First of all, uh, we see the prerequisite for communing. In other words, God is about to reveal something to Abraham, and he says, if we look at verse number 16 and 17, and the men rose up from thence and looked towards Sodom, and Abraham went with them to bring them on the way, and the Lord said, Shall I hide from Abraham that thing which I do? Uh, so we see here, the Lord says, Am I going to keep from Abraham the thing that I am planning on doing? And the Lord answers that question in verse number 18. Seeing that Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation, and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him. For I know him that he will command his children and his household after him, and they shall keep the way of the Lord to do justice and judgment, that the Lord may bring upon Abraham that which he hath spoken of him. 
And so we see then that the Lord speaks to Abraham concerning uh, Sodom. But there are, you see, the Lord speaks of some prerequisites for this communing. In other words, the Lord is going to commune, speak with Abraham based upon Abraham's known record that the Lord knows. Now I want us to consider that first of all, the first prerequisite for communion, for God speaking to man, is first of all, it takes the commitment of the Lord. The Lord, it was the Lord that came to Abraham. It was not Abraham that came to the Lord. The Lord came to Abraham and wanted to speak to Abraham. Now at the beginning of the chapter, he spoke to Abraham about the uh, Sarah, about the promised son, and he uh, spoke of those things, reiterated the promises, and now he is continuing to speak to Abraham. Uh, and we have to understand that it came from the Lord himself. He is the one that committed to uh, commune with Abraham. And today I believe that uh, we, uh, God speaks to us because he's given us his word. He is committed uh, to speak to man, and he does that uh, through his word. And so we understand, for example, in John chapter 15, verse 14, Jesus told his disciples, Ye are my friends. If ye do whatsoever I command you, henceforth I call you not servants, for the servant knoweth not what his Lord doeth, but I have called you friends. For all things that I have heard of my Father, I have made known unto you. You see, Jesus Christ revealed uh, what the Father wanted them to know. And here, uh, the, the, the God speaks to Abraham because he wants Abraham to know something. We see, first of all, it takes the commitment of the Lord, but secondly, we consider the character of Abraham. The Lord says in verse number 18... That he, he would not hide from Abraham the thing that he, that he would do, seeing, verse 18, that Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation, and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him. For I know him, that he will command his children and his household after him, and they shall keep the way of the Lord to do justice and judgment, that the Lord may bring upon Abraham that thing, uh, uh, that which he hath spoken of him. Now we consider the Lord mentions the character of Abraham. First of all, he speaks of his public association. He says, I'm not going to hide from Abraham the thing which I do, seeing that Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation, and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him. Now, this remark is made in reference to Genesis chapter number 12. If we go back again, that's Jesus, uh, or the Lord is quoting again uh, the call of Abraham initially in Genesis 12, notice verse 2. And I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee, and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless thee, and curse him that curseth thee, and in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. You see, the Lord uh, goes back to the promise he had made to Abraham in Genesis chapter 12, and he says, I'm not going to hide from Abraham the thing which I do, uh, seeing that I will make of him a great nation, uh, seeing that uh, this is what I'm going to do in the life of Abraham. But notice here, in that initial promise in Genesis 12, uh, the Bible says, and I will. Make of thee a great nation. The Lord says, and I will bless thee and make thy name great. In verse 3, and I will bless them that bless thee and curse them that curseth thee. And in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. You see, it was the Lord that said, I will make of thee a great nation. It was the Lord that said, I will bless thee and in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. And so, as Abraham had obeyed the Lord, he departed from Ur of the Chaldee. Uh, the Lord now, he, uh, he uh, reveals, he communes with Abraham knowing uh, that Abraham has been called out of this world. And so he says, I'm not going to hide the thing which I do because Abraham is the man that I've called out from the world to be a witness unto me, and we know Messiah would come through the line of Abraham. And so he speaks his character of Abraham in his public association, but secondly, in his private reputation. Verse 19, he says, for I know him. Now, the Lord says that I know him. The Lord knows us. Are we aware of that? He knows everything about us. Notice, I know him that he will command his children and his household after him, and they shall keep the way of the Lord to do justice and judgment that the Lord may bring upon Abraham that, uh, that which he hath spoken of him. Now we note these important words from the Lord, for I know him. You know, may these words pierce our own hearts and bring conviction upon our private affairs. Our children and our household speak of the private life of man. Abraham was not a man 
who would live in a public association, association to the Lord, but then neglect his private reputation. You know, it is easy to put up a show <coughs> in our limited public association, but it is difficult to keep a wholesome private reputation before those who, to whom we know best. You see, God looked at Abraham and says, he's going to be a great nation. He's going to be these, uh, the Hebrew people would be the representatives of God in the world. And they would have this great display of the blessing of God upon their lives and the prosperity of God upon their lives. But another thing that God associated Abraham with is that in his private affairs, he would also be a faithful man. In Psalm 25 verse 14, the Bible says, The secret of the Lord is with them that fear Him. The secret of the Lord is with them that fear Him. And so, the Lord says, I'm not going to keep the thing which I do from Abraham. Why? Because I know Him. I, I know the way He is. I know how I'm going to use Him in this world, but I also know that in His private affairs, He is going to be a faithful man, and therefore I'm willing to commit this secret unto Abraham. You see, Abraham would command his children and his household to keep the way of the Lord and to do justice and judgment. The words to do justice speaks of doing what is right. Doing what is righteous. What is morally acceptable in the sight of God. But the word judgment speaks of having discernment. Having the ability to reach a verdict. You see, Abraham in his private life would live a righteous life and he would also make the right decisions. Now, we know that he was not perfect. We see his failure. But a summary of his life would be thus. And so, I believe that that is a prerequisite, prerequisite for the Lord communing with Abraham. The character of Abraham. But we also see, thirdly, the condemnation of Abraham. Sodom. Uh, the Lord reveals, notice in verse number 20 and 21, and the Bible says, And the Lord said, Because the cry of Sodom and Gomorrah is great, and because their sin is very grievous, I will go down now and see whether they have done altogether according to the cry of it which is come unto me, and if not, I will know. Now, we've already read a little bit about Sodom. If we go back, if we look at a little bit of the history there between Abraham and Sodom, if we go back to Genesis chapter number 13, you remember the conflict between Abraham and Lot? And uh, Abraham asked Lot, says, you can choose uh, whichever side you want. And we knew that Lot chose the plain of Sodom. And the Bible says in Genesis 13, verse 10, And Lot lifted up his eyes and beheld all the plain of Jordan, that it was well watered everywhere. Before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. So notice here, the Lord already tells us in His Word He's going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. It's going to happen. Uh, they are a wicked people. And the Bible says, Even as the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt, as thou comest unto Zoar. If we notice in verse 13, But the men of Sodom were wicked and sinners before the Lord exceedingly. Now, there is no doubt as we read the Word of God that we find that every man is a sinner. Uh, so this is not talking generically about any sin. This is talking about there's something that is particular about this city that is, uh, that is uh, uh, very wicked. The Bible says, sinners before the Lord exceedingly. He talks about in Genesis chapter number 18 that he hears the cry of Sodom. In other words, that idea of crying, the cry of Sodom means that they know they're doing perverse things. They know that they're involved in wickedness and they flaunt it. They rejoice in it. They shake their fist in the face of God and says, you go ahead and stop us if you can. That was the people of Sodom. We will see that in the other week. You know, the Bible condemns the sin of Sodom. Uh, and we'll look at that uh, extensively when we deal with that next week. But in Leviticus chapter 18, verse 22, the Bible makes it clear Thou shalt not lie with mankind as with one mankind. It is abomination. Leviticus chapter number 20 verse 13 says, If a man also lie with mankind as he lie with a woman, both of them have committed an abomination. They shall surely be put to death. Their blood shall be upon them. In Isaiah chapter 3 verse 8 and 9, the Bible says, For Jerusalem is ruined and Judah is fallen. 
because their tongue and their doings are against the Lord. Do you see that? That's what was going on in Sodom. Their tongue and their doing was against the Lord to provoke the eyes of His glory. You see, uh, it, is, uh, it gets to the place where man knows what is righteous. He knows what is right. But he flaunts its, its sin in the sight of God. He provokes the Lord. He stands against the Lord. He speaks against the Lord. And he says in Isaiah 3 and 9, The show of their countenance, talking about Jerusalem there, doth witness against them. And they declare that their sin is as Sodom. They hide it not. Woe unto their soul, for they have rewarded evil unto themselves. In Isaiah, the prophet Isaiah was called to Jerusalem, and the warning that Isaiah gave to Jerusalem, he says, you have become like Sodom. You have flaunted your sin. You've spoken against God. You've uh, defied God and said, you go ahead and stop us. You see, such was the sin of Sodom. The cry came to the ear of the Lord. And so we see not only the prerequisite for the communion, but secondly, we see the purpose of the communion. The Lord is going to reveal the thing that He's going to do to Sodom. But notice here in verse 20, if we look at those verses, the Bible says, And the Lord said, Because the cry of Sodom and Gomorrah is great, and because their sin is very grievous, I will go down now and see whether they have done altogether according to the cry of it, which has come upon unto me. And if not, I will know. And the men turned their faces from thence and went toward Sodom. And so the angels go toward Sodom. But Abraham stood yet before the Lord. And Abraham drew near and said, Wilt thou also destroy the righteous with the wicked? And so notice here, pause for just a moment here. Uh, uh, Abraham knew what God was doing, was going to do. Now the Lord didn't say, if you look at the text in the conversation, when the Lord reveals to Abraham, He does not say to Abraham, I'm going to destroy Sodom. He says, I'm going to look and see what they're doing and see if it is so. And Abraham interprets that and asks, knowing what the Lord's going to do. Because he knows the wickedness of Sodom. And he says, are you going to destroy the righteous with the wicked? I want us to consider the purpose of this communion. The Lord, why would the Lord come to Abraham and reveal to Abraham the thing that he's going to do? Why? Well, I believe for the same reason that we have the Word of God today and that God has revealed Himself to us so that we can know God. So that we can know the mind of God. Now, we are not God. We will never be infinite with God. We are just finite. But the Word of God, the revelation of God, it gives us everything that we need to know. And here the Lord is basically uh, communing with Abraham. He's revealing to Abraham, I believe, certain truths about himself. Now consider, first of all, I listed four things as to the purpose, or five things as to the purpose of the communion. First of all, this is what we learn. That man becomes familiar with God's judgment and justice. In communing here with Abraham, Abraham would become familiar with God's judgment and justice. Now, so far, we've known that, haven't we not? In the book of Genesis, we saw the worldwide flood, the destruction of the world. We saw the dispersion of the Tower of Babel. And so we've already seen some signs uh, that God has poured out His judgment upon a people that have forsaken Him. And so here, uh, uh, the Lord simply reminds Abraham by revealing, by communing with him, uh, that He is a God of judgment and justice. Uh, If you notice in verse 23, And Abraham drew near and said, Will thou also destroy the righteous with the wicked? God had not said that he would destroy the city of Sodom. He understood it as destruction, and he knew that it was valid. You don't find Abraham at any time saying, God, you shouldn't do that to a wicked city. He's just asking, Are you going to destroy the righteous with the wicked? Because the wicked deserve destruction. But are the righteous going to face the same consequences as the wicked? And so Abraham here becomes familiar with the judgment and the justice of God. Notice in verse 25, he says, Abraham speaks and he says, That be far from thee to do after this manner, to slay the righteous with the wicked, and that the righteous should be as the wicked. That be far from thee, shall not the judge of all the earth do right? Now that's a good question. Shall not the judge of all the earth do right? Yes, of course. He is going to do right. And Abraham is going to discover that in this communing. 
He's going to discover that God would not slay 50 righteous with a wicked city. He's going to discover that God would not destroy uh, 45 righteous with the wicked. He discovered that God would not uh, destroy the city for 40's sake, for 30's sake, for 20's sake, for 10's sake. He would not destroy the city, and he revealed that to Abraham. But isn't it interesting that even though that was not met, God still spared the righteous? He did. And if you notice the language, we'll go there, uh, we find that the language is the angels grabbed a hold of Lot his wife, and his daughters, and brought them out. You see, God did not destroy the righteous with the wicked. Now what's interesting is the life of Lot stops after that, but here this is simply Abraham understanding, asking this question, shall not the judge of all the earth do right? And by the end of this passage, Abraham understands, yes, he is going to do right. He is not going to slay the righteous with the wicked. And perhaps Abraham didn't even know at the end that God spared Lot. Because that's all we read. Lot goes out of the city and there's never any mention of Lot in fellowship with Abraham. There's never any time when you see Lot conversing with Abraham or Abraham knowing. You find Abraham at a distance looking at the destruction of Sodom not knowing that Lot was spared. Shall not the judge of all the earth do right? Yes. He will always do right. Have we noticed here that we're reminded, first of all, of God's judgment and justice. The Word of God is all about that, isn't it? That God is the judge of all the earth. The Bible talks about in Romans chapter number 2, uh, Romans chapter number 2, that God is not a respecter of person, that God is the righteous judge. Uh, that every evil thought, every idle word will be brought into judgment. God is the righteous judge. He will exercise judgment and justice. And by the way, that is where it all ends at the end. The devil and his angels will be judged because of the justice of God. And also we understand that all those that are unbelievers that have rejected Christ will also be judged with the devil and his angels. Why? Because God is a just God. And so we see here in this communion, the purpose is that man becomes familiar with God's judgment and justice. But number two, man becomes familiar with the devastation of a wicked people. Verse 23, Abraham asked this question. Wilt thou also destroy the righteous with the wicked? Now, the Bible already read, we find first time in Genesis chapter number 13, that there was the consensus in that day. Uh, we find that the people of Sodom were wicked men before the Lord. Abraham knew that. Lot knew that. But Lot decided to pitch his tent toward Sodom. Now when we read in this passage, he was inside Sodom. Living inside of Sodom. And so we see the progression. But you remember when uh, Sodom was taken captive? I, I really believe that this is a reminder for us of how God deals with a man and how God deals with that city because God brought about a, a group of people to take Sodom in captivity and it was almost for them a warning. You are not invincible. Uh, you, uh, you're not, you, you cannot continue to go on without there being consequences and it was almost like a warning sign. And who was it that delivered Sodom? It was Abraham, the man of God. How ironic, almost like a warning sign to Sodom to know the judgment of God is coming. And you see what was done in the city. Uh, you see God is justified to destroy the wicked because what was going on in Sodom was exceeding wicked. I believe it, bring, it would bring us back to the times of Noah where every imagination of the thoughts of man's heart was only evil continually. And the only righteous was Noah and his family. And so we're reminded here that the whole world was destroyed because of the wickedness of the people. And here Sodom is going to be destroyed because of the wickedness of the people, you see the city of Sodom was devastated because of those wicked people. We'll see later in the next chapter, we find that as the angels came in there, a group of men surrounded the house of Lot and said, we want to know those men. 
They wanted to be in a relation with them, a sexual relation with them. First time Israel. And these were the angels of the Lord. Now they appeared as men, but we understand, we understand how quickly and how devastating that city was. Can you imagine the conditions of, the, uh, of that city? Uh, can you imagine the crime that was going on, the disease that was going on, all of the uh, side effects of the wickedness of the people? And by the way, things have not changed a whole lot. Uh, there is a, a great number of people that are involved in wickedness and you can go to really the, uh, the largest countries of our own nation where the streets aren't safe to walk on, where the water is not safe to drink, where you're not even safe to just go to the grocery store and get your medicine. And that's what they become. Why? Because of the wickedness of a people. And it's out of control. And so we see that as God reveals Himself to Abraham, we understand God's judgment and justice. We understand the devastation of a wicked people. But thirdly, we also, man becomes familiar with the value of a righteous people. If you're righteous today, do you know you're valuable to society? Verse 24 says this, Peradventure, Lord, Abraham asked the question, There be fifty righteous within the city, will thou also destroy and not spare the place for 50 righteous that are therein? Now, that's a good question. Lord, are you going to destroy, if there's 50 righteous people in the city, are you going to destroy the wicked people with 50 righteous? And the Lord simply answers, and He says, No, I would not destroy the city for uh, 56. He goes on for 45 righteous, for 40 righteous, for 30 righteous, for 20 righteous, for 10 righteous. And so we see here that we understand as Abraham, as he's communing with God, he comes to understand the value of the righteous people of God and the difference they make in a society. And we must be aware today with all the things that are going on and all the wickedness that is going on, we must be aware that God has not poured out His judgment as He wants upon the wicked for the sake of the righteous. And so that's what Abraham learns. The value of a righteous people. He goes all the way down in verse 32. Pure adventure, ten. Ten righteous shall be found there. Now, Sodom was a large city. Sodom and Gomorrah were large cities. We're not talking about hundreds of people. We're talking about thousands of people. And God would have spared the city of Sodom even if there was only ten righteous. Wow. Do we see the value of righteous people? Say, well, we're not the majority. If there's ten, it was enough for God. So, we become familiar with God's judgment and justice. We become familiar with the devastation of the wicked people. We, we become familiar with the value of righteous people. But fourthly, we become familiar with God's mercifulness. You say, well, I don't see how God is merciful in this passage. Well, notice verse 32. And he said, Abraham said, Oh, let not the Lord be angry, and I will speak but yet this once. Peradventure ten shall be found there. And he said, I will not destroy it for ten's sake. Now, we know here that Abraham works his way down. And uh, sometimes, and people have uh, attributed that and said, Well, you see, Abraham was bargaining with God. No, he was not bargaining with God. He was just asking, What are you planning on doing? Are you going to destroy the city, even if there's ten righteous in the city? And so, as he discovers that, Abraham now is learning that God is merciful. That God is gracious. Uh, isn't that how the way it's worked already in the book of Genesis? Do you remember when, uh, when God told Noah to build an ark that God would judge the earth? God said that He would strive with man for 120 years. God extended His mercy his graciousness to a wicked world for 120 years. As Noah was preaching righteousness, he was preaching people to repent. The Bible in the New Testament tells us that Noah was a preacher of righteousness and he was telling the people to repent for 120 years. And God was merciful 
to a world that was involved in all kinds of wickedness. And here as Abraham is asking 50, 45, 40, 30, 20, 10. And he understands the history of Sodom. He recognizes, oh God, you're a merciful God. Isn't that how God has dealt all throughout the word of God? For example, you look at the period of the judges. Judges would rise up and the people would repent. Get right with God, then they would fall back into sin. God would raise up another judge. They would fall back into sin. The cycle is seen over and over and over again. And I'm thinking, does not God get tired? No, he is a merciful God. Isn't it what he did when the nation of Israel was divided? There was another kingdom, the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. And you have the major and the minor prophets. Uh, these men who were sent to the king, uh, to those nations, to cause the people to repent. And God gave them a timeline. And God said it's going to be this many years. And if you don't get right with me, uh, the judgment of God is coming. And the men like Isaiah and Jeremiah would prophesy and would tell of Israel uh, that the judgment of God is coming and it would go year after year after year for hundreds of years. And that was a testimony to Israel. It was a testimony to the men of God who were preaching to the nation of Israel to repent. It was a testimony that God is merciful. And if we're not careful, we look at the Word of God and we become troubled and we look at, wow, look at the judgment of God, but look not just at the judgment of God, but look at the mercy of God and His delay in exercising His justice and His judgment to bring the people to a place of repentance. And God is still doing that today. The Bible tells us that God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And therefore, perhaps that is why He is delaying His coming. That is why perhaps He's delay delaying the great Tribulation that's going to come upon an unbelieving world. The great tribulation is just that. It is going to be the judgment of God poured out upon a wicked world. You say, well, when is he coming? Perhaps he's delaying. Because he's a merciful God. But we learn one more thing. Man becomes also familiar, number five, with his accountability to God. Whether righteous or wicked... All will answer to God. And that's what Abraham discovers. Would you, Lord, are you going to destroy ten righteous with, that are found with the wicked in that city? And the Lord says no. But what that communicates to Abraham is that both the righteous and the wicked are all going to answer to God one day. You see, in this communing, that's the purpose of this communion. Now, as we read the Word of God, there are many things that we know about God, but these are simple truths that, we can, that Abraham knew about God as God came to him and revealed himself to him and what he was planning on doing. But I'll just consider lastly, and we're done, the privilege of communion. The Bible says at the end, uh, notice in verse number 32 and 33, and he said, Oh, let not the Lord be angry, and I will speak yet, but this one's peradventure ten shall be found there. And he said, I will not destroy it for ten's sake. And the Lord went his way. As soon as he had left communing with Abraham, and Abraham returned unto his place. Now some people have said, well look, Abraham knew that, that was, ten was the limit. <laughs> I don't think so. You see, uh, Abraham knew that God is a righteous God. That he will do what is right. And that's what Abraham discovered. And the Bible says in verse 3, and, when, and the Lord went his way as soon as he had left communing with Abraham. The word left has the idea of as soon as he had ended his time of speaking with Abraham. The Lord came down and spoke with Abraham, revealed himself to Abraham about what was going on. And Abraham would learn some important truths about God, about the righteous, about the wicked. And now the time is gone and God leaves. He ends this time of communing with Abraham. You see, this communing was not about God discovering something new about Abraham. It was about Abraham discovering something new about God. 
You see, the idea of communing is a special conversation taking place between two parties. There is always one who initiates the communing, and here it was the Lord. You see, it was the Lord that left. It was the Lord that came and spoke to Abraham, and it was the Lord that left when the communing was ended. You see, communing is the disclosure of truth that was not known to Abraham before. <clears throat> the Bible tells us in Exodus chapter 31, verse 18, And he gave unto Moses when he had made an end of communing with him on Mount Sinai, two tables of testimony, tables of stone, written with the finger of of God. God had communed with uh, Moses in Mount Sinai and had given man his law where man would know who God is in a greater way. Uh, in that what the Ten Commandments reveal, it reveals for us who God is. In Exodus chapter 25 verse 21 the Bible says, And thou shalt put the mercy seat above upon the ark, and in the ark thou shalt put the testimony that I shall give thee, and there I will meet with thee, and I will commune with thee from above the mercy seat, from between the two cherubims which are upon the ark. Uh, so we see here that God desires to speak to man. He desires to commune with man. He desires to reveal himself to man. And I like how Hebrews 1 put it. The Bible says, if you go there with me, and we'll uh, be done in Hebrews uh, chapter number 1. The Bible says in Hebrews 1.1, 1, 1, God, who at sundry times and in diverse manner spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, Abraham would be a father, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high, being made much better than the angels, as he hath by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. Uh, for unto which of the angels said he at any time, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee, and again I will be to him my father, and he shall be to me a son. And again, when he bringeth in the first begotten in the world, he saith, And let all the angels of God worship him. And of the angels he saith, Who maketh his angels spirits, and his ministers a flame of fire? But unto the Son he saith, Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever a scepter of righteousness, is the scepter of thy kingdom. And so the book of Hebrews begins with, God speaks. God desires to reveal his, himself to man. God want, wants man to know him. And man can know God through the Son Jesus Christ. Because that is how God has fully revealed himself to man. And so as I read the end of the book of Genesis, and I read how God left communing with Abraham, we consider the privilege. The privilege that Abraham had for God to come and to reveal himself to him. And today we have an immense privilege for God to desire to commune with us to speak to us through his word, through his son, through the spirit. He says later in the book of Hebrews, harden not your hearts as in the day of provocation. Don't harden your hearts to the spirit of God. And so God has revealed himself to us in all of those ways, through his son, through the scriptures, through the spirit. And we can know God. That's a wonderful thing. Although God is infinite, he can be known, and he desires to be known. Amen. And so, may we look in the face of God and say, you've revealed yourself to us. And I'm troubled today at the language that's being used by many people that says, well, you know, you preach that God, but that's not what God is to me. Can I say, it matters not what God is to you. What matters is who God is. God does not change. He has never changed, and He will never change. And He revealed Himself, and so all we need to do is discover God, who He is, 
as He has revealed Himself to us.